absolutely innocent. The hindrance is innocent. That is, should be echoing in your mind. It's me. It's my, my input of whether or not I am going to pay attention to that hindrance or not. And as I mentioned in the um, Samyutta Nikaya, in the Bojanga Samyutta, if you are a longtime meditator and you're really attempting to go the, down the path, if, you're, if that's what you're really trying to do, you must understand uh, that in order to do that, you have to simply step back and allow it to happen. I know it sounds crazy because some training is making, uh, we're not sure where this came from or when it exactly started, but there is a lot of emphasis on work to be done to the hindrance, work to be done about the hindrance. And anything that is giving that kind of directive is pointing to feeding the hindrance. You see, that's what is missing here. The texts that are explaining the nutriment. And the, the article that I rely on mostly in the Samyutta Nikaya and the Bojanga Samyutta is really about the seven enlightenment factors. And the point is you cannot go down the path and, and in the super mundane way, finally, you cannot go down the path and get through if you are attempting to try to do that too hard. It will not work. And in order to get through the whole path to fall into cessation, um, the way it works is nothing. You don't ever get to another level unless, um, unless you have reached the proper conditions for yourself to fall into the next level. Because actually, you don't make it happen. You allow it to happen. This is the thing. You allow the progress. That is what the Buddha found in 36, um, Majjhima Nikai number 36. If you start reading the section at 30, section 30, and read from there, what exactly happened to him that changed his um his direction with his pet with his practice what exactly is it that he remembered and and what is it that he figured out by remembering that remembrance that he, he remembered okay um and that tells you something that you have to consider what does this really mean it means basically um that you have to allow certain things to go on in your practice that are not dangerous for you, that are wholesome things for you to observe, for you to understand. And you need to understand how everything works. See, the objective of the meditation from the beginning is to um, see and understand clearly the Four Noble Truths, Dependent Origination, and the Three Characteristics. And if you master these three pieces, and especially uh, the dependent origination from the links, the seven links that are going on all the time in this, in the life continuum line all, daily on a daily basis, which is, you know, contact, feeling, craving, clinging, habitual tendencies, and the birth of the reactions, and um, if you're doing it from there and you can start back at the sixth sense base, okay, sixth sense base, contact, feeling, craving, uh, clinging, and habitual tendencies and birth of action, that's what's happening to you on a regular basis with every single solitary event that happens through your life. And, and for you to understand how things work, the more you understand that, then the steadier you become. And what they were trying to get you to understand in the discussions on page, um, I think it's 1591 or 1594 in the Bojanga Samyutta, um, there's a discussion that goes on it. It's basically titled the, um, it's discussing the nourishment of the hindrances. 
and the denourishment of the hindrances. That means that you correct it. The nourishment of the hindrances, it's telling you what that is. And then it's saying the denourishment of the hindrances in direct relationship to the arising or the non-arising of the seven enlightenment factors. And those factors are always operational when you're meditating, certainly. But when it says the arising of them, it's speaking about the arising of the balanced line of all seven. That's really what it's talking about because they have to come into perfect balance before you fall into the cessation, the Neroda, okay. So it tells, it's explaining it. So once you read that, it's like, I look at it and I say, okay, there's no excuse for you to play dumb anymore. There's no excuse for you to be fighting with the hindrances anymore because that told you point blank, do not, spend any careless attention on a hindrance that is nourishing the hindrance so you have to have careful attention in the process of your practice so that you do not place attention on the hindrance at all you know hindrances we say hindrances are teachers and if you want to back up on that it doesn't mean um we need to spend time in their classroom with them and let them lecture to us. <laughs> what it actually means is we need to observe how uh, there's a change in our body and mind in the tension levels that happen during meditation. There's a change, a rise in tension and tightness as craving is arising. And so when you are understanding these things then when you're practicing using twim it allows you to watch this and be aware of it and i really like the vipassana student who comes to work with me because they have been taught to be aware of sensations in their body and in their mind in the vipassana practice and so they're already tuned to noticing if there's something going on here or here in the body or in the mind. And so they are faster. They're much faster in training because they don't have to learn how to do that first, you know? So it's like, this is sort of like giving you a higher speed bike to work with if you're a bicyclist and all of a sudden I'm moving you from a 20, you know, a 10 speed bike to a 21 speed bike. And now we're gonna learn how to run with a different set of gears and we're gonna, we're gonna see how it takes us down the path. So he says, basically here, he pursues the path, develops it. Um, where am I? Mm -hmm. Right. He, he uh, pursues the path. The path is generated to him and then he pursues the path, develops it, cultivates it. And as he's pursuing, developing and cultivating it, the fetters are abandoned and the underlying tendencies are uprooted. Once again, the fetters themselves, when you look at the list of 10 fetters, um, they're going to be abandoned, meaning the mind isn't going to go and spend time with them anymore. The underlying tendencies for them are going to be uprooted because they're not going to be fed anymore. And there, it all makes sense with what I just said about how they operate. So that is looking at the four possibilities of how um, the, uh, the bhikkhu can be practicing and get through and um, go through to have the path generated and get through the path and develop and cultivate it to the end. And that one was the one that was in the Anguttara Nikaya. Now, when we go over Samyutta Nikaya, okay, we go over to Samyutta Nikaya now. And now we're going to go through these. We're not going to spend a lot of time on them. They're very short, but I just want you to listen because it's very nice the way they did this. And this is showing you Mogalana Samyutta. Uh, it's in um, book number 40. And it starts on page 1302, Connected Discourses with Mogalana. On one occasion, Venerable Maha Mogalana was dwelling at Sawati in Jetta's Grove, Anathapindika's Park. 
And there the Venerable Mahamogalana addressed the monks thus. Friends, monks, friends, those monks replied. The Venerable Mahamogalana, he said this. Here, friends, while I was alone in seclusion, a reflection arose in my mind thus. It is said, the first jhana, the first jhana. What now is the first jhana? And then, friends, it occurred to me here, secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, a monk enters and dwells in the first jhana which is accompanied by thinking and examining thought with joy and happiness born of seclusion. And this is called the first jhana. Then friends, secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered and dwelt in the first jhana. I dwelt there in perception and attention accompanied by sensuality, it assailed me. And when, friends, then the Blessed One came to me by means of spiritual power and said this, Mogalana, Mogalana, do not be negligent, Brahman, regarding the first jhana. Steady your mind in the first jhana. Unify your mind in the first jhana. As I said, continue watching very carefully. Concentrate your mind in the first jhana, not too hard, very gently. Then, friends, on a later occasion, secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered and dwelt in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and examining thoughts and joy and happiness born of seclusion. And if friends, one speaking rightly could say of anyone, he is a disciple who attained to greatness of direct knowledge with the assistance of the teacher. It is of me that one could rightly say this. Now, he did this with the assistance of the Buddha. And here we talk about direct knowledge. For those of you who hadn't heard me say this before, the method the approach of training for the Buddha in his meditation schools appears to be direct knowledge, not to believe anything without direct knowledge of seeing it for yourself. And this direct knowledge is the same thing as knowledge and vision when we see that. He demanded that we practice to attain knowledge by seeing it, knowledge and vision. And that became the foundation stone for the evolution of knowledge and wisdom, okay? Now, the second jhana, here, friends, while I was alone in seclusion, a reflection arose in my mind thus, and it is said, the second jhana, the second jhana, and what is the second jhana? And then, friends, it occurred to me here with the subsiding of thinking and examining thought that a, a monk enters and dwells in the second jhana, which is internal confidence and unification of mind. Now, remember, not too tight. When we say unification of mind, we mean, again, unification in continuing your observation, obeying the rules for investigation and observation, in, is without thought and examination or thinking and examining thoughts. And it has uh, it has joy and happiness born of this level of concentration that we're doing. This is called the second jhana. And then, friends, with the subsiding of thinking and examining thought, I entered and dwelt in the second jhana. And while I dwelt therein, perception and attention, it accompanied me by thought and examination. It assailed me, perception and attention moving sometimes. And then, friends, the Blessed One came to me by means of spiritual power and said, Mogalana, Mogalana, do not be negligent, 
regarding the second jhana, steady your mind in the second jhana, unify your mind in the second jhana, concentrate your mind in the second jhana, okay? And then on a later occasion, with the subsiding of thought and examination, I entered and dwelt in the second jhana, which has internal confidence and unification of mind. So second jhana is where you start to get uh, more confidence because you begin to see and watch things uh, in a balanced way, similar to the way you watch in the first jhana. In, you keep it going. Is with this unification of mind is without think, thinking or examining. So you're not going off and examining things anymore. Remember that. So as you're in there and you have joy and happiness born of this level of concentration. And this is why in Visuddhimagga, in the first pages explaining concentration, they made this remark that in this work, so from that point in where it first starts talking about concentration and meditation through the whole book, he's saying that this concentration should be a profitable concentration. So what does a profitable concentration mean? And a profitable concentration means a concentration level which allows you to get to path easily. It makes perfect sense. You try it yourself and you'll begin to understand. But if there's too much concentration, this doesn't work. You won't reach path easily and begin to go down this way. So we have to pay attention to that. And if friends, uh, one is speaking rightly, could say of anyone, he is a disciple who attained the greatness of direct knowledge with the assistance of the teacher. It is me that one could rightly say this. It is of me. So he's saying basically he could say that it was easy for him to go from the first to the second jhana, and he, and he could do that by keeping these balancing points that they're pointing to out, okay? And then the third jhana, here, friends, while I was alone in seclusion, a reflection arose in my mind. And it is said, the third jhana, the third jhana, what now is the third jhana? And then it occurred to me here with the fading away as well of the joy that a monk dwells equanimous and mindful and clearly comprehending. So now you have to be able to be comprehending, which gives us a hint that the, uh, the level of the concentration was not tight and really hard. He experiences happiness with the body. He enters and dwells in the third jhana of which the noble ones declare he is equanimous, mindful, one who dwells happily. And this is called the third jhana. Now then friends with the fading away as well of joy, I entered and dwelt in this third jhana. And while I dwelt therein, perception and attention accompanied by joy assailed me and started to come much stronger. And then, friends, the Blessed One came to me by means of spiritual powers, and he said to me, Mogalana, Mogalana, do not be negligent regarding the third jhana. Steady your mind in the third jhana. Unify your mind in the third jhana. Concentrate your mind in the third jhana. Just stay where you are as you are discovering everything. Stay in that as you're moving along, but don't try to control anything. Just allow your brain, your mind to be able to experience these pieces. And then on a later occasion with the fading away as well of rapture, or we say joy, I dwelt equanimous and mindful and clearly comprehending. So his equine equanimity came in and settled him very well. And he was very mindful, able to observe clearly and comprehend what he was watching. I experienced happiness with the body. I entered the dwelt in the third jhana of which the noble ones declare he is equanimous, mindful, one who dwells happily. And you just sit in the third jhana. And third jhana is where you're going to lose some of the feeling of your body and just allow yourself to sit 
and let everything just go. If friends, one speaking rightly, could say of anyone, he is a disciple who attained to greatness and direct knowledge with the assistance of the teacher, it is of me that one could rightly say this. And then the fourth John is the next one. Here, friends, while I was alone in seclusion, a reflection arose in my mind thus. It is said the fourth jhana, the fourth jhana. And what now is the fourth jhana? Here, friends, it occurred to me. Here, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous passing away of joy and displeasure, a monk enters and dwells in the fourth jhana, which is neither painful nor pleasant and includes the purification of mindfulness by equanimity. And this is called the fourth jhana. And then friends, with the abandoning of the pleasure and pain, I entered and dwelt in the fourth jhana. And while I dwelt therein, perception and attention accompanied by happiness assailed me. This perception of it came out, this attention accompanied by a lot of happiness assailed him. But then friends, the blessed one came to me by spiritual power and said, Mogalana, Mogalana, do not neg be negligent regarding the fourth jhana, steady your mind in the fourth jhana, unify your mind in the fourth jhana, concentrate your mind in the fourth jhana. And then on the later occasion, with the abandonment of pleasure and pain, with the previous passing away of joy and displeasure, it's this a passing away of uplifting joy is what this is about. I entered and dwelt in the fourth jhana, which is neither painful nor pleasant and includes the purification of mindfulness by equanimity. So now in the fourth jhana, basically what's happening is equanimity is a, is a part of many things along the path as we're going one, two, three, four through the rupas. There's like a little bit of it. And then in another level, there's just this much of it, just like just like there are two, two little, um, a two-legged creature is walking like this, but he can fall over like that, or he can fall over like that, he can blink out too, <laughs> okay? A three-legged one is like a tripod with a camera, and it actually can tip over in the wind if you're not careful with a tripod. It has to be a four-footed equanimity that happens in the fourth jhana, and the steadiness of this four-footed sort of, this four-footed kind of animal, this four-footed is very steady. If we look at an elephant, look at a horse, look at a rhinoceros or anything, you got four legs there. It's very, very steady. And then you have to be steady like that in order to, um, in order for you to, to come, um, into the mental realms, you have to be steady like that, okay? So this is where they say the equanimity in the fourth jhana happens. They don't mean there's no equanimity in one, two, and three, but they mean that it's a stable equanimity that happens when you are in the fourth jhana. So it will carry you without any bothersome, bother about it, you know, um, into infinity of space, base of infinity of space. So here, friends, while I was alone in seclusion, a reflection arose in my mind thus, and it is said the base of infinite space, the base of infinite space. What now is the base of infinity of space? Then, friends, it occurred to me here the complete transcendence of perceptions and forms is the trend with the passing away of perceptions of sensory impingement with non-attention to perceptions of diversity. You are aware that space is infinite. 
a monk enters and dwells in the base of the infinity of space. And this is called the base of infinity of space. Let's look at a couple of these things they've said here. Complete transcendence of perceptions of forms. Now, we like to say transcending gross perceptions of forms, not absolutely all levels of forms. Because if we say perception of all levels of form, we wouldn't be able to watch anything else. And that's not, doesn't seem to be what's happening when we're practicing to when we're just allowing it to happen. We don't lose the sense that we can watch things all the way into the seventh level we can. So with the passing away of perceptions of sensory impingement, and see, that's where it's saying perception, perceiving a sound or a sight or an odor or a flavor or tactile feeling. And the perceptions of, um, of your these working at all. And we don't find this experience the same way for, Mo, for Mogolana's experience and Sariputta's experience. And what we're basically experiencing is what's happening for Sariputta. We're able to still watch. We don't hear anything. Okay, we hear things in that level but very far away. I remember the first time we worked more implicitly with this, with Bonte sitting, telling six of us, you know, this one, this one, this one, this one, you know, and we went into infinite space. Many of us really like infinite space. I like it. I like to sit there and watch infinity this way in front of me, but infinity behind me and to the left and right around me and understand, try to grasp the clarity of the fact that I am not in the center of this, but in all directions that I would be able to look and see with my eyes closed, look in the front, behind, to the right, to the left, above, below, anywhere, it's receding away from me, but I cannot see a horizon. It's just infinite. It's a, it's a, a remarkable uh, sensation of the insignificance of me <laughs> being there. And why, how does it work that I automatically think I'm the center, you know, but then if I look more closely, I realize I'm not the center. The non-attention to perceptions of diversity and perceptions of diversity are all different kinds of things that are coming up around you and you have no inclination whatsoever to investigate anything that is arising anymore as a hindrance. Now, see people when they're practicing, they will tell me, well, I had this experience and I let, they're not quite clear. Let me see if I can say this without wandering all around. When we're practicing the way that we practice twin, our observation is very keen and very sharp. And what we need to remember is if you are practicing and you are telling me in interview, I had to six, sorry, this, I was pulled out here and had to do this and had to do that. If you're talking about fourth jhana, you're not there. When you're pulled out, you're pulled out of fourth jhana when something arises. And then you come back in and gradually as you continue to six R, you are sending a message to your brain when there is absolutely anything that moves or draw, you know, comes into the frame of vision inside or um, seems to wiggle off onto the side, just um, we say wiggling like under the surface of the water. If there's looking at a lake where there's just glass on top of the lake and you just feel this tiny wiggle underneath the water, anything like that. The moment that we pay attention to it at all, you're going outside of the level that you were in. And then you're coming, falling back in again. 
after you six are you're falling back in again. So this is a different kind of practice because we are going in and out and in and out as we're learning this. But then see, we go further after we have gone through once uh, to cessation, we come back and mm, reconnoiter, we re-examine the situation and we see, hmm, I'd like to know exactly what is happening in first jhana, what is really happening in second, what is really happening in third and fourth and infant space like that. So when we teach you to do determinations and we say, now you can practice, I will sit no higher than infinite space. And probably 90% of the time, if you say it that way, I will sit no higher than infinite space and then start sitting. You will not go anywhere except to there. I will sit no higher than the first jhana. You will not go any higher than the first jhana in that session. See, this is a, a special way of talking about determinations in order to get to clearly understand each level. That's what this is. And it's a funny thing. I tested what Bonte was trying to explain to us if I say, I will sit in the first jhana. It doesn't work. Or I will, uh, I want to sit in the first jhana. Doesn't work. Or now in this practice, I will sit in the first jhana. No. For some reason, the brain doesn't want to hear one tiny bit of desire to sit in the first jhana. And so if you say it this way, though, it works. I will sit no higher than the first jhana. And you sit down. Now, you have to practice this for yourself to find out how funny it is, but it just can't seem to work any other way than to say, I will sit no higher than. So that way, you are not really ordering anything. You were just saying, I, don't, I will not go any higher than that. That's a different kind of order. And it seems to work with the brain most of the time. Why would you do that? Because you're curious. And because we can't forget two things, curiosity and persistence. They're kind of the, the assistants on the bench that are the extra ones for the seven factors of enlightenment. You know, the main players are the seven factors, but these two are sitting on the bench in case you need a little bit more curiosity or a little bit more persistence that they're like the junior players that are ready to jump in and help. So we had perception is diversity, aware that space is infinite, by being aware it means that you were sitting there and just watching it and you begin to understand why it's called infinite and there is no boundary to it out on the edge. It just keeps going and going and going. So that's how you get through that. And then friends, the blessed one came to me by means of a spiritual power and said, Mogulana, Mogulana, do not be negligent regarding the base of infinite space. Please steady your mind in the base of infinity of space. Unify your mind in the base of the infinity of space and concentrate your mind in the base of infinity of space. And then on a later occasion, with the passing away of perceptions of sensory impingement, with non-attention to perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite, I entered and, uh, and dwelt in the base of infinite uh, space. So that's describing how he was practicing once to see it, another time to sit in it and get to know it a little bit better. And if friends, one speaking rightly could say of anyone, he is a disciple who attained the greatness of direct knowledge with the assistance of the teacher. It is me, uh, of me, that one could rightly say this and it would be true. So the base of infinite consciousness comes next. And here friends, while I was alone in seclusion, a reflection arose in me, in my mind. Thus the base of infinity of consciousness, the base of infinite consciousness. Now, what now 
is the base of infin infinity of consciousness. And then friends, it occurred to me here by completely transcending the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite. Consciousness never stops, just never. Um, a, a, a monk enters and dwells in the base of the infinity of consciousness. And thus it is called the base of the infinity of consciousness. And friends, by completely transcending this base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite, I entered and dwelt in the base of the infinity of consciousness. And while I was dwelling therein, perception and attention accompanied by the base of infinity of space assailed me. And then, friends, the Blessed One came to me by means of a spiritual power and said to me, do not be negligent regarding the base of infinity of consciousness. Steady your mind in the base of infinity of consciousness. Unify your mind in the base of the infinity of consciousness and concentrate your mind in the base of the infinity of consciousness. Okay. And then as on a later occasion, by completely transcending the base of the infinity of space, aware that consciousness is infinite, I entered upon and dwelt in the base of infinity of consciousness. And if friends, one speaking rightly, could say of anyone, he is a disciple who attained the greatness of direct knowledge with the assistance of the teacher. It is of me that one could rightly say this. Now, Infinity of consciousness. What is it we can learn there? When we're practicing the way that Sariputra was practicing and seeing things arise one by one as they occur and watching everything happening, this is where you tend to see some lights happening. Now, there are different kinds of lights, and I want to get a couple things cleared up. First of all, if there's a light that comes and then it grows and then, you know, you think you can move it up and down like this and around, let go of that. It's a hindrance. It just wants you to play, play, play and not get to the point. This is very funny. It's like a detour. Okay. So we don't want that to happen. Um, then there are twinkle lights that happen up in the top. Twinkle lights are to be let go of. They're like like you would see in a sky or something. And that's not, not something that you can learn anything from either, okay? And then there's like flashes that happen like this inside. Remember, your eyes are closed. You do have a dark screen in front of you. And if you watch closely this dark screen, sometimes you will see little lights coming and they are, they are coming from... Uh, the right of your screen, okay, the right of your screen, and they're moving across like this, and they're going, and they're moving across the screen like this, going up like that. We like to call this uh, like a flickering of an eight millimeter projector that gets, is, you put the film in, the old fashioned film in, and they put it in wrong and it goes flick, 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 flick. Now, when you first see these, if you see these, first they're doing really fast, like like that going across. And it's hard to watch them. Then they slow down as you're very patient and you keep watching them. What you wanna to try to do is kind of look underneath the little light here at the base underneath what happens before it comes up keep your eye on it see if you can tell what is happening at the base of that light because in order for there to be movement and for that light to move up like that there has to be something underneath it that's important for you to find and you talk to a guide about it they'll explain it to you okay um that's only one way that you can experience individual consciousnesses. There's a few ways that you can actually do that. And another way is you might feel, some people will feel a tapping inside the cheek, a tapping. And this is what you pay attention to. Do I feel like a tapping like this inside the cheek? Or 
have I had the experience where in my ear there's a like that, you know, <coughs> a tone <coughs> that is repeated. That's another version of the little light coming up and down. Infinite consciousness, if we get to watch it, is proving to us that consciousnesses are ceaseless, that they just keep coming and coming and coming and coming. And they're not permanent. They're always arising there and then gone, arising there and then gone. So it's one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. Born, exist, die, born, exist, die. So it's it's basically birth, birth, death, birth, death, women, birth, death, birth, death, birth, death. And then it's like birth, death, birth, death. And then I think Walt Disney picked up on it. But it do 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 but it but it do 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 they're happening really, really fast, like that, really, really, really fast. But if you keep watching them, something funny happens. You're it's kind of like your mindfulness speeds up and gets even with them or something. And they start to look much slower. We know that the brain is not slowing down the firing, but you can watch these happen. And it's true with the tapping. It's true with the ten, these little sounds. And this is not tinnitus. This is just a, a, a single tapping of a sound like that that constantly happens. And you let go of it that's what it is you're watching. Then friends completely transcending the base of infinite space, aware that consciousness is infinite, I entered and dwelt in the base of infinite consciousness. And while they're in the perception and attention accompanied by the base of infinite space assailed me. Then friends, the blessed one came to me by means of spiritual power and said again, Mogalana, Mogalana, do not be negligent. Brahman, regarding the base of the infinity of consciousness, steady your mind in the base of infinity of consciousness. Unify your mind in the base of inf infinity of consciousness. Sit, sit very, very still, very, very quiet. Just watch, okay? Concentrate your mind in the base of infinity of consciousness. And then on the latter occasion, by completely transcending the base of the infinity of space, aware that consciousness is infinite, I entered and I dwelt in the base of infinity of consciousness. He sat in infinite consciousness and just watched. And then friends, one speaking rightly could say of anyone, he's a disciple who he attained to greatness and direct knowledge with the assistance of the teacher. It is of me that one could rightly say this is true. And now the base of nothingness, when he was in seclusion, a reflection arose in his mind, the base of nothingness, it is said, the base of nothingness. And what now is this base of nothingness? It occurred to me here by completely transcending the base of infinity of consciousness, aware that there is nothing, that the monk could enter and abide in the base of nothingness. And that is called the base of nothingness. And then, friends, by completely transcending the base of infinity of consciousness, aware that there is nothing, I entered and dwelt in the base of nothingness. He just sat there in the nothingness. And while I dwelt there in perception and attention, accompanied by the base of the infinity of, of consciousness, assailed me. So it assails you, but you don't move, you don't you stay where you are and you just keep watching. It's like a test when you move from one to the other, the last one pushes and then you just stay there and you just keep watching. You don't let go. And then friends, the blessed one came to me and said with power, do not be negligent uh, in the space of nothingness, steady your mind in the base of nothingness and unify your mind in the base of nothingness and concentrate your mind in the base of nothingness, meaning watch, watch, watch. You are a watcher. You are not a doer. In these mental realms, your body's gone. Don't get involved with anything having to do with body and just sit and watch. So you are the witness, that's all, just a witness. 
and then on a later occasion by completely transcending the base of infinity of consciousness, aware that there is nothing. I entered and dwelt in the base of nothingness. And if friends, when speaking rightly, could say of anyone, he's a disciple who attained the greatness of the direct knowledge with the assistance of the teacher, it is of me that one could rightly say this is true. Now, the irritating thing about nothingness, what could be irritating about it? Sister Kama, there's nothing there. <laughs> yeah, but in this lifetime, when you're a busy bee, in charge of things, handling everything, managing everything to get to this level is extremely, can be frustrating, it can, just extremely frustrating because you're used to something going on and all of a sudden there is nothing going on. And you should be just sitting back and witnessing this so that you could describe it to someone who's never been there and sort of say, there's nothing there, nothing is happening. And this is the irritating part of nothingness. But at this time, there's a few things you can do to settle your mind while you're watching. And that is to take the seven factors in your mind to consider them. So we had mindfulness, right? And your mindfulness is your continual skilled observation of what's happening. That's your mindfulness. And your investigation is to just observe without comment, without judgment, impersonally watch what is happening to see how impersonal it is and not having to do with you. That's what you're attempting to do. And then you continue doing that. And you learn from this place of nothingness, from your observation. So now you're doing your in investigation, you have energy level, it should be very quiet and very calm and very steady. And your joy is internal and flowing through you. Keep smiling. Keep smiling when you're here and when you are in the deepest states, it's important just to keep it this way when you're practicing. And if you haven't heard, there is a muscle that runs up the sides of your nose and it goes in about where your eye is into the brain and that basically releases pressure on the pineal gland and the pine, pineal gland and the pineal gland can then um, let go of the endorphins or the, the dopamine that's there. And it just calms you and allows you to just steadily sit there and watch in the depths of the darkness. Very, 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 very calm. Base of neither perception or non-perception. Here, friends, when I was alone in seclusion, a reflection arose in my mind thus. And it is said that the base of neither perception or non-perception, this base of neither perception or non-perception, what now is the base of this neither perception or non-perception? There's not, at the time you are in this, there is no perceiving, but there is not, it's not that you're not perceiving either, neither perception or non-perception. Because after you come out of this sitting, if you pause for a moment before you get up to walk, you'll have flashes of what happened while you were in this position. Now, this is recounted in the, in the commentary. It is recounted in, by many writers experienced in this state. So the way this thing works is and they say, you're not perceiving while you're in it, but you're not not perceiving because there's a part of your brain that is holding on to whatever it is that is going on, but you're not involved with it because you can't see it or there's no way to explain. You can't experience it. Okay. However, when you get up and you start walking, the images of what was in there during that session will pop up. The I saw blue, six are it, immediately six are it. Um, I saw a pattern that was shaped like this, you know, let it go, relax, smile, come back. As you're walking, you see another one. I saw little straight things across the screen in all different kinds of colors, let it go. 
and your brain will keep bringing up this imaging, a pattern, a square, little lines, little dots, whatever, colors, shapes. Just let it go, let it go, let it go. That's the main song. Whenever an image arising, don't let it be surprising. Whenever the image arises, let it go, let it go, let it go. Keep thinking that way. Let it go, let it go. It's not important. And then, friends, it occurred to me here by completely transcending the base of nothingness, a monk enters and dwells in the base of neither perception or non-perception, which is called the base of non neither perception or non-perception. By completely transcending the base of nothingness, by enter, I entered and dwelt in the base of neither perception or non-perception. Well, while I dwelt there, perception and attention accompanied by the base of nothingness assailed me. You wanted to fall back into what you were doing in the prior level is kind of what that means, but you just keep going forward and watching. The friends, the blessed one came to me by means of spiritual power and said, Mogalana, Mogalana, do not be negligent regarding the base of neither perception or non-perception. Steady your mind in the base of neither perception or non-perception. Unify your mind in the base of neither perception or non-perception. Concentrate your mind in the base of neither perception or non-perception. And then on a later occasion, by completely transcending the base of nothingness, I entered and dwelt in the base of neither perception or non-perception. And if friends, one speaking rightly could say of anyone, he is a disciple who attained the greatness of direct knowledge with the assistance of the teacher. It is of me that one could rightly say this. Now you get to the signless. Okay. The ninth is here, friends, while I was alone in seclusion, a reflection arose in my mind. Thus, the signless concentration of mind. The signless concentration of mind. What now is the signless concentration of mind? To reach Niroda, one must not be concentrating on any idea, state, anything to reach. This is where really the whole truth of sitting back and just allowing this to happen becomes really, really important. Okay. Then friends, it occurred to me here, the non-attention to all signs, Amakotma enters and dwells in the signless concentration of mind. And this is called the signless concentration of mind. And then, friends, by non-attention to all signs, I entered and dwelt in the signless concentration of mine. And while I dwelt there, therein, my consciousness followed along with signs, trying to pull you out. There's an interesting phenomena, by the way. When you get to the mental states, you can meet it at any time, mostly it's very obvious in nothingness and neither perception or non-perception. And here, when you're trying to just not concentrate on any sign, anything at all, this is where it can become obvious. The brain is having a fit. It wants you to stop going so deep. It doesn't want you to do this because it's actually, I always thought of it as it's afraid it's going to lose its job. <laughs> and that's what I think of all the time. I was in human resources and I keep thinking it believes that you're going to fire it, but you're not going to fire your brain. Of course, your brain will always have a place, always have a job for running the whole entire body, certainly. But some of the things that you are going to lift off your brain as an occupation or part of what it does, it doesn't have to worry so much in the future. It doesn't have to fret and relive so much of the past that we constantly do to it. So a lot of weight is being lifted off of the mind. And that's the objective of getting involved to reach a signless state is to 
be in a state of absolutely no disturbance at all. And friends, the blessed one came to me and he encouraged me, do not be negligent. Regarding the signless concentration of mind, steady your mind in the signless concentration of mind and unify your mind in the signless concentration of mind, concentrate your mind in the signless concentration of mind. And on a latter occasion, by non-attention to all signs, I entered and I dwelt in the signless concentration of mind, which is the Rhoda. Okay, it's Nirodha. And if friends, one speaking rightly could say of me, he is a disciple who attained to greatness and direct knowledge. With the assistance of the teacher, it is of me that one could rightly say this. Okay, the last part of this is about this discussion, which Saka is involved, and I'll read it through to you. On one occasion, the Venerable Mahamogalana was dwelling. Oh, I'm sorry, this is a new section. I don't want to do that. I'm sorry. I thought it was part of the last one. So I throw open to the floor for the next 10 minutes or so anything that you have in a question on this. But basically, basically, it's his steps as he went through each part here, and he had the assistance of the Buddha, which was nice, encouraging him not to stop, encouraging him to keep up his factors of enlightenment and keep going with them, using all of them. And those factors are mindfulness, the investigation, energy, and joy, and then Joy fades away, tranquility arises, concentration becomes extremely balanced and profitable, and equanimity is the last part. And so a lot of times people don't understand quite what the equanimity actually is, but equanimity is an undisturbed mind. When anything jars you or jerks you, um, that... Um, makes it so that you just you just can't be disturbed at all. And it's uh, a lot of people think um, they're in equanimity, but actually um, it's a different state. It's, um, I lost the word for it, but it's not equanimity. If you're in equanimity, nothing disturbs you at all. If you're sitting in equanimity and it's real, you won't be disturbed by any hindrance whatsoever. It's how you can measure, am I really here? So equanimity is a discussion in itself. So let me let open to question. Anyone? Hmm? Go ahead, uh, you. Uh, hello, Sister Gima. Thank you for uh, the two sitters. It was, that's was really nice. Um, I've got a, a couple of questions. Uh, first of all, uh, the Buddha's uh, encouragement not to be negligent. Um, and when we're working with, with the twin, one of the things, um, uh, at least in my understanding, that we encourage is uh, just to allow the states to evolve naturally, not to try and push things along, uh, but to simply maintain um, the awareness and uh, to six R and uh, to stay present. Um, but the invitation not to be negligent suggests that uh, there's an analysis going on of these states, particularly the higher ones. Now, these states are being jhanas. They, they don't have hindrances as such uh, because hindrances and the jhanas are not compatible in the same time. Um, and so what sort of analysis is actually going on which says, ah, I need, to, I'm being negligent. I need to, I need to make more effort and what is the what is the nature of that effort i'm sorry my video looks um very um uh disconcerting um <laughs> it's okay you need a curtain on that window behind you it's yeah. stealing you <laughs> maybe are you are you on blur did you set it on blur no 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 i i'm afraid the uh, uh i think the uh the, the camera's got a, a a bit of a fault on it so oh, I okay, I, no problem. You look, more, you, look like you're a heaven, you look like you're a heavenly being come down here to talk to me. Okay. Oh, well, 
always a good assumption to make, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, uh, first of all, we have a strange practice, okay? Our practice is an in and out practice. And what I mean by that is it's very, it's very light. And when we're in jhanas, we want you to understand that if you're telling us there's a hindrance and you, there, are, it's a hard thing, I'm sitting in this jhana, but I'm having these things happen. We understand, but each time you have something happen where you go pay attention to it, you jump out of the jhana. I just want to be yep. sure that you understand this. Yep. Okay. Yep. Whereas when you're practicing in, in a, a one point concentration and you're in a jhana, you're locked in and they're, mm -hmm saying you don't you're not even in the jhana if any hindrance shows up you see they're yep. not looking at the reality of the hindrance and there's no there's no relaxed relaxation here you see in the yep. in the brain there's a, a tightness and a pointedness that is happening and going on mm -hmm. so when we listen when we look at these things and it's talking about that if you're negligent you move out to to um you move over to six arit because you're, you, well, I'm not saying don't six R, but I'm saying you, we're doing it quickly and staying there until finally the brain doesn't, the, the, doesn't produce these things anymore. They just don't produce them anymore because you're learning. We're not, it's, this, it's sort of the hindrance understands. It's not gonna have any place to go anymore because you're not going to pay any attention to it anymore. I, See, I understand that from the food. Mm -hmm. I understand that from the perspective of the hindrance, but the Buddha's yeah. advice is you're slipping back to a, a an earlier jhana. That's right. Uh, and, and what is what is that? What is that is what I kind of tried to mention. Your brain wants to stop you, and it, it plays this game of, oh my gosh, if he goes there, maybe he's not going to let me have a job anymore. I better stop him. So I push, push, push to get you, you liked, or you, per, let's say that you liked infinite space and infinite consciousness comes up. Uh, but as you're going into infinite consciousness, you have to be a bit more patient and quiet, but you liked infinite space. You liked watching the horizon. I went through this a lot. And Bonte would say, then you don't do that anymore. <laughs> Cause I would sit there and I liked infinite space. It made me feel good. And I liked the expansion of everything going away. So I would, I like, and my brain knew it. <coughs> and um, it pushes at you and wants you to come back. And he's saying, don't be negligent. Don't step back. Don't start going like this between the two jhanas is what it's saying. That's what he's saying, negligence. Don't do this. When you're here, make a commitment to sit and just witness and see what happens next. Then make a commitment to sit and not move and make just an observation of what can happen next. That's where this mindset thing comes in about the two-year-old. I always tell you, sit with no expectation at all. Sit in your meditation, set up your mind. I will sit just to see what happens next. That's a frontward moving thing, isn't it? What's okay, so right around the corner? What's right around the corner here what, in the next room? I'm doing that. But negligence would be just looking at this and then, oh, look, that's still back there. Maybe I'll go back there. Oh, look, this is here. Oh, that's there. That's what he's saying. Don't slip. He's trying. He was trying to help him not slip backwards. See? Uh, OK. Um, uh, yeah, I'm interested, if you like, in the in the leaning of the mind here, because um, when we when we're just observing, um, things can come back up again. Um, but I think what I'm understanding from what what you're saying is if they do come up, you just simply observe those again, but don't don't attach to them by saying, oh yeah, that's, you know, I'm familiar now, with that. Okay, now but, as a teacher, when you just say you simply observe them again, what does it mean when you say that to me? You simply observe them. You simply notice it happened and let it go. That's okay. Yeah. You simply yeah. observe them again. 
what does that mean? Because the practitioner who's not practicing TWIM would think that it means noting more is more than it really is. For instance, I consider the direction in some of the other practices of noting this and noting that as just being misunderstood. I think they, they didn't have a printer and it didn't say noticing this and noticing that. That's different than noting something. Yes. Noting something is in our terminology, an English speaker would say noting it means I go to it and what is this and I name it and that's noting it, see? Okay, and I think that's where the trouble comes and where everyone gets blocked with no more progress. Because if you're looking at noting that way, you are going back and forth and back and forth between noting a hindrance, meaning more than it should, instead of just noticing, oh, look, something came up out here and I don't have to pay any attention. Uh, oh, look, and, and it was gone. You see, part of this is, I think part of this is the depth of internalizing the understanding of anatta and at, I'm sorry, anicca, anicca, internally, internalizing the understanding of anicca. That's what I mean. Okay. Anicca is everything that arises will pass away. So why would you what by the time you're in those deeper states, you should understand, we should have told you enough enough knowledge about this stuff you should understand by the time you get into infinite space really whatever arises has nothing for me the hindrances have nothing for me the only thing they had for you as a teacher was that you had no nothing to do with them arising they impersonally arose were there and would pass away yeah See, this thing about the hindrance as a teacher, some people want to go sit with the hindrance and find out what they can teach you. <laughs> you don't want to get involved with that baloney because the hindrance has absolutely nothing for you, nothing. And so as you learn the different kinds of hindrances, and there's not just five, if you're confused about that, write me a note and I'll give you maybe 20, you know, 15 or 20 of them so you understand how many there really are. Okay. But you're not supposed to be going over there and, and sort of doing anything with that hindrance because of you're supposed to have the knowledge by the time you get to infinite space, you're supposed to be grasping from the lesson we gave you on the hindrances about um, you know how they operate, that you got it, that any attention you put on the hindrance at all, you're feeding it candy. And you're asking yeah. it to come back tomorrow. I'll have more. <laughs> it's that way. Uh, I have one other question, which was uh, your comments around nothingness and, um, you know, working with the frustration in nothingness uh, and to reflect upon the uh, factors of enlightenment, the, f um, the factors of awakening. Um, and would you would would that correspond to the idea of just balancing? Um, so that we, uh, you can feel when there's a little bit too much effort being made and ease back and when there's not enough being made and just a little bit more. Or yeah, the picture that we came up with to try to explain this to the person is like when you're in nothingness and moving in, moving towards neither perception or non-perception, if you're frustrated with it, there's one thing you can, uh, you can image in your mind that you're in a cave. I don't know if you saw Raiders of the Lost Ark, but it was Raiders, the Raiders film. And then there was the cr Last Crusade. But I think the Last Crusade was the one. And the Last Crusade in that movie, they had to, they had to walk the path to get to the chalice of Christ, you know, in the cave. And when they were walking through uh, the, they had to get through the uh, dangerous things. And when they got through that, they were on a cliff in on the edge of a chasm that was bottomless you know it was in the dark and it's bottomless and they threw some pebbles out because they thought maybe there was a path but they couldn't see it because it matched the rock you know so uh we we said to a number of our students um have you ever seen somebody walk on a high wire and on a high wire they have a uh 
they have a stick, you know, a pole they're holding in their hands like this with two hands in front of them. And it's very long. It's very, very long. And it's what it, the purpose of that is it's pressing you down on the wire. So if your feet are walking on the wire the right way, they're, they're walking like this, okay, like that. They're not trying to walk on the wire like this. They're trying to walk like that and like that across the wire. So this, this pole has to get absolutely balanced, okay? Absolutely balanced. And if you want to, you just imagine that you have this pole and on you're holding it in the middle and that's your mindfulness of holding it in the middle. And on one side, you have the investigation energy and joy. And on the other side, you have tranquility and you have concentration and wisdom and you're, you're balancing it like this as you're crossing over the chasm. And when you have it balanced exactly right, and just let go of this whole idea, usually you'll fall into neither perception or not perception. You just, everything kind of shuts down and then you don't know where you are. And the one thing I didn't mention about the neither perception or non perception is like, you, you are, it's like when you come out and you sit there, your big question is, did I sit in concentration right now or did I sleep? That is your question. If you have that question come up in your mind, you can be pretty sure that you were uh, sitting in neither perception or non perception. Then if you stay on the cushion for a couple minutes, those images will start to come up and you can, as they come up, you just let them go, let them go, let them go, let them go. And you are emptying out the whole entire trip down the path was a level of cessation path. It was, going down and letting go, letting go. And if we look carefully at the chart that David gave us in the book about the components of each one of the jhanas, if you look at them, then you lose it, then you lose it, lose it, lose it, lose it, lose it, till you get to the bottom. It's a path of cessation, ceasing, ceasing, ceasing. So this is why we just sit with the idea of watching what is happening, but you're only watching what's happening here. You are not watching what's happening back there or over here, just here. And you're not interested anymore in, um, let you just keep letting go, letting go. I don't, I run out of little words. I mean, I'm sure if somebody had a big vocabulary, there must be some other kind of word, but to me, it's just letting go, letting go, letting go and stepping back and stepping back and just watching with a curiosity still there of the two-year-old, what could be around the corner next? What is gonna happen next? See, yeah? Mm -hmm. yep. And then, yeah, so that's kind of what's going on. I probably evaded the question or did I answer it? I can't remember if I did. What were you saying? Uh, no, I think that's, uh, that's fine. That's. Uh... That's given uh, um, some clarity around that um, uh, because uh, the, the temptation is to is to um, perhaps over, overthink around uh, the factors of enlightenment rather than, if you like, feel feel the factors of enlightenment. Uh, yeah. Feel feel when the balance is present. Uh huh. Exactly. Exactly. It's all about balance and. And let and letting go of in any personal investigation. You can't be there to fall into cessation. And it may you may argue with me about that if you like. If you did, I would say, well, for a split second you weren't there, and that's when you fell in. That's what happens sometimes when we see somebody go through, but the the um, effect of going through doesn't stay with them very long at all because it wasn't quite, they hadn't really let go totally to get through. You can tell what's happening when you start watching everybody go through, you know, and experience this. So what is the going through? Does anybody want to know that? You should tell me. <laughs> what is this going through? Um, I think the best thing anybody has told me, asked me about this, and then they came up with their own description has to do with computers. And most of us have computers. 
And if we, our computer gets clogged up and I'm good at that, okay. And then the, the mouse is frozen and you can't figure out what's wrong. If you can't troubleshoot it, what you're going to do is you're gonna restart your computer. Now, in the old days, we called this rebooting the computer. Shut it off and reboot it. We didn't have a restart button back then. We just had an on off. Okay, and then they came up with this restart thing. What is really happening is you are shutting down, uh, shutting down the operation of the brain and just you're going into an empty spot. And when you, you all of when you reboot a computer, you turn it back on, it comes back on on a default. That's where it comes back on a, on a default without the problem usually. So what are you dumping? Well, the whole entire time that you've been practicing, uh, you from the time you first began TWIM, uh, you have been steadily learning to let go of the past and let go of the future. So let go of any thoughts that are from the sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair of the past. And you are also letting go of the worries of the future. That's how you clean out everything. So when you're, when you're uh, meditating, sometimes people hit a wall. And when we put you through the forgiveness meditation, sometimes what we do, it, we do that just for cleansing. Enough out of you, not the whole program but en enough that you could come back and continue a retreat and use the Mecca, you see? And not be blocked again. So you get enough of the idea clear, leave everything alone here, leave everything alone here, work right here in, in the, in the uh, section here of the present time, work there, and that's all. So Everything is about letting go and you're letting go of me just to see what would happen. We're not letting go of me permanently. We're not letting go of your personality. That's not true. And you no, know, I can tell you that very frankly, you might not see monks smiling. Yeah, but behind the scenes, everybody has a personality. Everybody has uh, smiles and ups and downs and they're all working on their practice, see? So don't let anybody kid you about this. They're not all walking around like robots and not smiling for real. You see, it's not the case. And I don't want people to think that you are destroying yourself ever. You're just examining the consequence of a self versus the consequence of no self. And the effect of that is taking things very personally, or looking at the world through impersonal glasses, non-judgmentally looking at it and being able to stay in the present time more. That's the cleansing. That's what this is all about. Can you actually live in a world where you see what is essentially happening and you don't get involved in what is unessential. Because what is unessential is, you know, this is just like what happened at Aunt Mary's house. This is just like what Jim did last year. This is just like this and just like that. That's getting involved in the past. And in the future, you know, I was worried about this. And now look at this. Look at what's happening. I was thinking about the future. And now look at this. That, 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 that. That's the future. And, you know, if you let go of both of those, you have a pure mind, a still point, a clarity, a, a point of, uh, of clearness to work with. And you're experimenting with what would the world be like if we all played a game for the weekend, even just one weekend, where everybody in every interaction immediately forgave what was happening involving what they were doing and the other person immediately used some compassion because you don't know that other person and you don't know where they're at when they're doing what they're doing and they don't know you. So if you, that act of compassion is giving yourself the space to see what's real here and then loving kindness, unconditionally loving the other person then responding. Let's find out what's really happening before we jump. Yeah. 
that's a new idea yeah mm. <laughs> so yeah i'm on track you <laughs> yeah okay well that was uh, that was interesting as well so yes thank you for that uh that, that was the end of my my questions you're in the dark now <laughs> My goodness, you're in the dark completely. <laughs> but I know you're not in the dark. I know you understand this. <laughs> okay. Anybody else have questions about this? No questions? Hmm? Hello, sister. Hi. Yes. Uh, Hi. Sister, myself, uh, I'm, my name is Sachin. I'm mm -hmm. following Trim from last uh, one and a half year. Uh -huh. Through YouTube, I have I've been following Bantam Ramsey. And recently, I'm following uh, your talks also. Yeah. Uh, one thing just I want to share that uh, actually my baby has a genetic disease. She is oh. uh, three years old. Uh -huh. She is uh, uh -huh. almost bedridden. Uh, it is... Uh, Fortunately, we have got this twin before knowing about the disease. And uh, now we are not uh, like sorrow. We are happy with what we have. And we are practicing uh, twin. And we are feeling happy that we got twin at the right time. Where uh, how, old, how old is she now? Uh, she is now three years, uh, four months. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, she well, is she being... Um, will she live with this or will she pass away with this? Uh, she live. She will live with us now. Yes. Uh, she's uh, being fed through na uh, NG tube. Uh huh. Only uh, hand movement she will do. Other body parts uh, like uh, she could able to see, but uh, she will not uh, speak or anything. Mm -hmm. She can't yes. speak. Okay. Uh, she can speak. Mm -hmm. uh, just to have one doubt. Earlier, we have asked through some uh, one uh, monk also. We have asked a similar question actually. Like uh, our baby has born as a human kind. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, because of this condition, uh, she could not able to walk on any path, any spiritual path. Mm -hmm. It is because because of her uh, last karma. Can we say like that? That's the way the Buddha explains it when things like this happen. Yeah, it's something happened in another lifetime. But I want you to understand something. It's important. When we talk about this this way, it's not this child's karma. It's confusing. I know it's confusing. But it's another being's karma. Uh, something happens and then... In this life, in this form, you know, that that consciousness came into this being as it was born. And it's a very unfortunate situation, you know, that she has this um, genetic disease and and then she has to go through this. But your but your position of giving her the most that you can possibly give. There's another way to look at this whole thing. She's a gift. She's a gift to you, you know? And she's been put here for you guys. Yeah? She's been put here for you guys to deal with. And you will learn something from her being here as long as she lives, that you will learn a lot from this, the two of you. It's a challenge for you to stay together. It's a challenge for you to take care of her. It's a lot of work and it gives you a chance for love and for the patience it takes, the equanimity it takes, the balance for the whole family. Are your parents with you too? Uh, no, actually no. my wife, uh, Sindhu, she also practices the twin. Uh -huh. But we you're doing parents. the right thing in smiling and keeping uplifted and um, she can see, right? She can see. Yes? Yes. yes she yeah. Can. can she can she respond with smile? I see her smile. Can she respond, right? Sometimes she responds. 
like uh, uh-huh. if she uh, listens my words so sometimes i tell her namo tassa bhagavato harato samma sambuddhassa then she smiles yeah okay <laughs> see i will tell you something about little children when they're born um you know we had some the church i used to be in was uh, a mormon church for about seven years and they were very they had very interesting ideas like god has a wife i like that one <laughs> I thought that was very fair that God had a wife, you know, and um, other churches didn't want to talk about that, but the Mormons were ready to say God had a wife. Okay. Uh, but um, one man, he said, you know, his, he had eight children and the last one born, she was very small and she was so cute. And um, she was cute for a long time until she was like four or five, four years old or five. She was really, really, really cute, you know, and then she started to grow up more. But the thing about her was she had the light on her, you know, from heaven. This is what the he gave a talk once. But he says, we saw the light on her from heaven. These little children are close to where they came from. They came from you. But if there is a heaven, they came from the light of heaven. And this light is through them. I could see it in her when you just showed her to me. You see, yes. I could see it. Yes. See, see her eyes. You see her eyes. See that? Yes. Yeah, and this is she she's giving you love in you watch her eyes and she can maybe communicate with her eyes some, you know, to you guys. Yeah, see, I can see that. And so she has this light inside her and she's a gift. And you're doing really, really well with this. Both of you, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And you take you take care of her and you love her, and she's there as a lesson for you guys. Yeah, side to side. Thank you for sharing that. So Thank you, sister. Always remember that. Anybody have any questions? Okay, we say a prayer. Let's see. We say our prayer for the end. Okay, I have a, there it is. Okay. <laughs> My little bell gets mad at me if I don't have this to hit it, gets very upset. <laughs> okay, here we go. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours and may they long protect the buddha's dispensation sadhu 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 thank now, you sister you are very welcome. I won't be doing a Sunday class. Um, I'm, I think we're, there's a Sunday class usually at uh, three o'clock, I think it is. But I'm not sure there will be one this weekend because I'm traveling and getting ready to travel. So there might be a Sunday class on, uh, oh, I'm sorry, wait a minute. They said I'm flying on Monday, okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, so we do the Sunday class, and that one I think is at three o'clock. It's at a different number, but you'll see an announcement for it. It's the Australian group. If you want to come to that, you may come and join us. And then I'll be going to Poland and um, starting with a project in Poland that will run for about 12 weeks. And then we'll see, I'll be coming back later if there's enough left of me i will be coming back and and doing retreats uh with delson armstrong up in uh, the himalayas in deer park and then in bodh gaya and then at jetwan so if you didn't sign up for those if you want to try to sign up for any of those you can sign up for them there's still openings i think in the in the jetwan one i think there are still some and the, i think they have the new building now so you can call and check. It should be kind of cool because I think the big building is finished. Oh, this is so 
much fun. Okay. And that's going to be the Dhamma Sukha Meditation Hall. If you didn't hear about that, that's what's going to happen with that. And we're just tickled about that, that we're going to have something named after us. Um, you know, that's kind of cool. So you all have a good week. Be happy, share your smiles, and you guys have can really share your smiles. And I bet she's kid a twinkle in her eyes every time you go in and share with that. So be happy, okay? Good. Thank you. So much. Thank you.